we have a lot of folks traveling. I guess they're taking advantage of the end of the summer. We have a large number of our people out today. So for those that are online, I know you stopped all your plans just to watch or to watch later. So at least don't blow that fantasy for me. So uh, anyway, we've been in a series called Divine Mentors. And we're in week eight, and we've been looking at people in the, in the Bible like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Daniel and eventually David. And I think we've learned some things along the way. One of the things we've learned is that these are just ordinary men. These were just people like us, and they did extraordinary things. They had incredible faith. They believed God could do what God said he could do. They were messed up people. We've looked at their lives. Some of them, you're like, why did God let them do that? But God's promises are true, we've learned. that When God says he's going to do something, he's going to do something. When he warns them before they go into the promised land, if you do this, you'll be blessed. And if you do these things, worship other gods, those sort of things, I will literally destroy you. And they saw that God's word is true. Stories and lives in the Old Testament, we've seen how every single person in the Old Testament foreshadows the Messiah to come. We've seen Jesus in the lives of these men. They've experienced moments that give us a glimpse of the Messiah that would one day come. We've seen this with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, and now Daniel. We've seen the Israelites turn toward and away from God like a swinging door. We've watched them wander through the wilderness. We watched them whine and complain to Moses and Aaron and Joshua. Probably drove them nuts. But we've also seen ourselves in their stories, haven't we? Why do we study these men? Why did God give us their stories in the Bible? Paul answers that in 1 Corinthians. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased. For they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things took place as examples for us. That we might not desire evil as they did. Now these things happened to them as an example. But they were written down, don't miss this, for our instruction. On whom the end of the ages has come. We're not studying these to be history people. We're studying these people because God wants to teach us something about their lives that we can apply to our lives. Paul says that God wrote these stories down. They've been handed down from person to person to person for over 2,000 years so that we today could be instructed. That we won't desire evil the way many of them did. And that we can learn a lot about ourselves from them. This week, somebody asked me, who is your favorite? I've been thinking a lot about that this week. My response initially was Moses, because he had such a great leader. He put up with so much stuff from the people that he led. It's amazing he didn't just, like, take off. But there's always been something about Daniel that I admire. Daniel has taught me more than probably almost any other person in the Bible other than Jesus. Daniel had something in his life that for most of my life I didn't have. We're going to look at that today. You see, I spent a large part of my life, and I've shared this with you guys before, I hate the person I used to be. I, I, don't, I don't mean that like, wow, no, I hate the person I used to be. I spent a large part of my life forcing my opinions onto other people. I loved to argue. I loved to have discussions with others that were deep and challenging and enlightening, but never for me. You'd be enlightened only when you decided to agree with me. It was great. You see, my opinions were always right. My assessment of the facts and my conclusions were never wrong. I would argue about my opinions at the drop of a hat, and I would drop the hat. I was right. I had to convince everybody that my way was the right way. I worked very hard on being right about all my opinions. So if you disagreed, you must be wrong. 
After all, why would I intentionally be wrong about my beliefs? I really believe them. You see, my arrogance was surpassed only by my level of obnoxiousness. One day it dawned on me, why, when I joined a conversation group, I was soon the only one left standing there. I was literally running everybody off. Fortunately, God has changed me, and I'm no longer that person anymore. I've mellowed, and I actually have friends now. But isn't that the catch with our beliefs? I mean, when you really think about it, no one in their right mind would intentionally be wrong about something they believe in. The problem we have is that our beliefs are not truths. For many years in my life, I call it BC, I didn't have any truth. Whatever I thought was true was true, period. I had my truth, you could have your truth, and your truth, by the way, should always agree with me, but you could have it. You see, if your truth is based on your feelings and your opinions, then they can change over time with almost any circumstance. Your truth becomes what works best for you in that moment. But when I found Christ, my entire world changed. I realized that my truth wasn't truth at all. The very foundation of my life for 33 years had been a lie. I discovered that there's only one truth and there's only one source of truth, and that's God. As I grew in my faith, I learned that my opinions, my beliefs, my truths had nothing to do with what was really true. God's truth existed long before I was born and long before he gave me the ability to have an opinion about it. His truth was truth before he allowed me to weigh in on it. People who live B.C. before Christ have no source of truth. They believe what they choose to believe, and that truth can shift and change as they decide it needs to. Before Christ, I had strong opinions. I was obnoxious, and I was arrogant with them. If you didn't agree with me, I just thought you were stupid, and I moved on. But A.D., after Christ, I began to realize something. When I surrendered my life to God's truth and his word, I found something rising up within me that I had literally never experienced before. And it was Daniel that showed me what was happening to me. As I read the book of Daniel early in my walk, I was struck by something very powerful. Daniel lived by convictions, not opinions. I'd never had a conviction in my entire life. An opinion is something you hold. A conviction is something that holds you. An opinion is something you'll argue about. A conviction is something you'll die for. An opinion is a strong belief, but a belief that could change under the right circumstances. Circumstances such as peer pressure, Family pressure, financial pressure, lawsuits, jail, threat of death, those will change your truth quickly. Most people will never die or suffer for what they know is just their opinion. They'll just change their opinion. But convictions? Convictions are beliefs that are held so strongly. They're the core to the essence of who we are, and they'll never change. The conviction is not something you discover. It's something that you purpose in your heart. Opinions come from your brain. Convictions come from your heart. Convictions are on the inside, and they will always, always, always manifest on the outside of your life. You can't hold your convictions in. When you believe something and you know something so strongly and it's in your heart, you cannot deny what's there. And if it's of God, the Holy Spirit will not let you deny what's there. 
they can't help but be expressed because they're the essence of who you are. If you want to define who you are, ask yourself, what am I willing to die for? That'll tell you quickly. A conviction comes from the realization that there's an absolute truth, an unwavering, non-compromising truth. It was the Holy Spirit that revealed that truth to me. And once I discovered that truth, convictions naturally followed and opinions faded away. Once God speaks, there's no need for my opinion. God has spoken and I've decided to surrender. Who am I to challenge the truth of God? I still have strong opinions about stuff, but I just surrender my weak efforts to understand truth and surrender them to God's truth. With a foundation of God's truth in my life, Opinions began to disappear and convictions began to rise up and define my life. What I believed in, what I would die for, not because I said it, but because God said it. Convictions are the few things that are non-negotiable in our life. They're unwavering. Beliefs that we're willing to die for. For Christians, convictions are the beliefs that we hold on to with everything we have because we know that we know that we know that God requires it of us. Convictions are why martyrs die. Opinions are why people lie. To violate our deepest conviction is to sin. Most people have a lot of opinions or preferences, but they have very few convictions. Daniel's story is all about conviction and what he was willing to die for. Let's take a look. Remember, Daniel has been taken to a foreign land, Babylon. We talked in detail about the Babylonians and how they were horrible and how they were just terrible and how they were just vicious and vile and disgusting and pagan. And yet God used them to punish his own people against his will, against their will. He just... He just told him, if you don't do what I say, I'm going to send an army against you and they're going to destroy Jerusalem. And no one believed him. Just like no one wants to believe there's a hell today. But there's something important to realize about Daniel. And let me divert for a minute and then we'll come back to this. George Shultz was secretary of the United Nations under Ronald Reagan. He had oversight of all the U.S. ambassadors all over the world. Every country had an ambassador from the U.S. They were there to represent the interests of the president. They spoke not their personal opinions, but their personal convictions based on the U.S. administration. An ambassador never speaks his own opinions or her own opinions. They speak for their government, for their king, for their president. They always represent the president and his or her agenda. Failure to do so was called treason, and treason is punishable by death. Secretary Schultz always had one final test for every person who was going to be an ambassador for the United States. He would say, okay, Mr. or Madam Ambassador, you've passed all the tests, you've been confirmed by the Senate, and you passed your security investigation. You've done all the things to get to position of ambassador, but you have to pass my test, and I have only one thing for you. And he'd take them over to the secretary's office to where there was a massive globe. And he would tell them, I'm going to spin the globe and I want you to put your hand on your country. Schultz would tell this story. Every single one of them failed. But I let him go anyway. Because whenever he spun the globe and he'd say, I want to put your hand on your country, they'd always point to the country they were going to, not the country that they're from. You see, the right answer for them is no matter where they went in the world, their country is the United States. Doesn't matter where they go. He'd say, never forget over there in that country that your country is the United States. You're there to represent us. You're there to take care of our, our interests and never forget that you're representing the best country in the world, he would tell them. 
God tells us that we're his ambassadors to the earth. We're his representatives sent here to represent his truth and his convictions based everything upon them. We're not here to give our opinions. We're here to represent our King and Lord, Jesus Christ. This place is not our home. We've been spiritually reborn. Once we were humans trying to have a spiritual experience, but now since surrendering to Christ, we've been spiritually reborn and we're spiritual people having a human experience. Our home is in heaven. That's where our citizenship lies. That's where our family resides. We are God's ambassadors to earth. And just like Schultz wanted to make sure that everybody knew who they represented, God has told us, look, when you're down on earth, don't forget whose you are and where your home is. We must never forget where our home is and who we're representing. Our home is heaven, and we're here to represent the interests of God in foreign and hostile lands. This is not our home. That's why Daniel's my favorite. His homeland was destroyed. His city was burned down. His people starved, and they died, and they were tortured in horrible ways. Just read Lamentations if you can tolerate it. He finds himself in foreign lands with people who worship foreign gods, who speak foreignly and have no truth at all in their system. And worse, we discussed in detail last week, he's in Babylon. Jerusalem is burned. The Jews have been almost annihilated. And it all happened because God turned his wrath against his own people. He brought the barbarian, pagan, Gentile Babylonians to attack the Jews. The Jews were despicable. I mean, the Babylonians were despicable people, and now Daniel is living in the midst of them. But that's the incredible thing about Daniel. Even though Daniel was in Babylon, Babylon wasn't in him. He knew to his core where he was from and who he represented. Daniel 1, verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. I talked about that last week. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand and some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Then the king commanded Aspenaz, the chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and nobility, for use without blemish, of good appearance and skillful in wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans, the Babylonians. We talked last week that when the Assyrians invaded the northern part of Israel, their tactic was to take everybody that lived there and just disperse them across the world so they could never come together and create a rebellion. Babylonians had a different idea. They took the best of the best of the best, shipped them off to Babylon, and then killed everybody else. And that way they could incorporate the smartest and the brightest and teach them how to be good Chaldeans. So you see what he's doing? He's calling the brightest and best from Israel to help him assimilate the Israelites into his empire. He thinks, if I can get Daniel and these three other men to become Chaldeans, to be a representative, then all the other Israelites will follow them. He has to assimilate them. He He wants to make them Babylonian Israelites. So they have to learn the language of Babylon. They have to learn the customs of Babylon, the tastes and values and ways of thinking and theology of Babylon. Can you imagine, just for a minute, can you imagine being in a sinful place where everything you know to be true is challenged and they're trying to force you to believe what they want you to believe? Can you imagine that? You say boy, they say girl. You say God, they say Mother Nature. You say sin, they say an alternate choice. Can you imagine living in a place like that? I thought you could. We have a great deal in common with Daniel. 
We're now in a foreign land because I believe God is punishing us for chasing other gods. What we know is being destroyed. We've dishonored God and we're at the very beginning of his wrath. Daniel 1, 5. The king assigned them a daily portion of food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years and at the end of that time they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belshazzar. Hananiah he called Shadrach. Mishael he called Meshach. And Azariah he called Abednego. We're going to indoctrinate these four men into Babylonian culture. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to feed them with the best the king has to offer. We're going to change their Jewish names to Babylonian names. But they didn't just change the names. Names meant something back then. Names were descriptors of character and purpose. Daniel means God is my judge. Great name for Daniel. God is my judge. Hananiah meant God is gracious. Misael meant who is like our God. Azariah meant God is our helper. Those were their names, Jewish names. Their new names, they weren't just chosen randomly. They were insulting and demeaning. They were meant to break down these four men. Daniel, God is my judge, is changed to Belshazzar. Bel is my judge. Hananiah, under God's grace, becomes Shadrach, under Aku's command. Mishael, who is like our God, becomes Meshach, who is like Aku. Azariah, servant of God, becomes Abednego, servant of Nebo. The Babylonians weren't just trying to give them new names. They were trying to give them new identities. Hoping that they and everyone else would see themselves differently as they're called something differently. It was all part of the Babylonian indoctrination. If you can't change the man, change the way people think about the man. Daniel and his friends were humble enough and smart enough not to balk at being renamed. They know that sticks and stones and Babylonian spears can break their bones, but names would never really change them. Interesting that Daniel never once went by his Babylonian name, not once. He always refers to himself as Daniel. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who has signed your food and your drink. For why should he see that you're in worse condition than the youths who are of your own age? So you would endanger my head with the king. Then Daniel said to the steward whom the chief of eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. And let our appearance and the appearance of our youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. Note something critical here about Daniel. Daniel resolved. The passage specifically says, but Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food. Daniel resolved. Notice that's past tense. Past tense. Daniel resolved. It's interesting that Daniel had already decided. It's past tense. There would be non-negotiables in his life, convictions that he would not go beyond no matter what the circumstances. He didn't just decide what his convictions were as the challenges arose. His convictions were there waiting to be applied to new circumstances. He had already decided. That's what convictions do. They don't change with circumstances, but they are revealed and empowered in circumstances. 
Daniel didn't make this decision in Babylon. He made it way back in Jerusalem. It's a product of what had been instilled in him, and it defines him at his core. He will not defile his God under any circumstances. He used the word defile. Defile means to make unclean, to bring about disgust, to bring filthiness upon oneself. Food wasn't the problem. Many think, well, it just wasn't kosher. It wasn't. Wine was not forbidden. The problem that Daniel had with food had nothing to do with the food. It had to do with the source of the food. He's not promoting a lifestyle of abstinence from alcohol or wine. He's not saying everybody should be a vegetarian. He's concerned that the thanks and appreciation for the food given to him is coming from the Babylonian king and dishonoring God because that's where the thanks should be going. Daniel knew what they were trying to do. They were trying to brainwash Daniel by trying to get him to forget where his food comes from. They wanted him to appreciate the source of food. It came from the king's table. Even though they were in a foreign land under a foreign king, Daniel knew that his food and his life depended not upon Nebuchadnezzar, but on God. And note, this request probably should have cost him his life. Challenging the king on anything in Babylon wasn't done. He just wiped out an entire nation, and that's his history. He's a vile, despicable man. Nebuchadnezzar has wiped out people for nothing. He would think nothing of murdering anyone, particularly an Israelite who's causing problems inside his own kingdom. There's only one reason Nebuchadnezzar didn't wipe Daniel from the planet. Verse 9, God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. Daniel stood for God, God stood for Daniel. So he listened to them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. I'm sure Daniel is now very popular with his colleagues. We've taken away the king's food. Here's some broccoli. I have it on good authority. There were no mushrooms involved in this. Just happened to know that. Not only were they as good as those who ate from the king's table, they appeared to be better in appearance and fatter in flesh. Daniel had to be an enemy among everybody in his midst. They took away food and wine and gave him vegetables and water. You got to love that. Note how God responds to Daniel's faith. And for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Three years later, the time had come. Daniel 1.18, at the end of time, the king had commanded that they should be brought in, and the chief of eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king spoke with them, and among them none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they stood before the king, and in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in all his kingdom. Daniel had convictions that were clear. Even though he was in Babylon, he'd already decided who he would live for and what he would live and how he would live and what he would not do. He'd already decided that you will not be able to train him in new ways of thinking. Go ahead. He already knows what he believes. It's not going to change. It's a conviction. You want to call him by a new name? Go ahead. He already knows where his identity is. You want him to deny the source of his provision to believe that King Nebuchadnezzar actually provides what he needs? No. I will not do that. Only God can be the source of what sustains and nourishes us. No one else can take his place in Daniel's life. That was the point at which he would go no further. I'm not doing it. His unique and restricted diet is a reminder and a reflection of where he came from. 
reminded him that he's a person of God living in a foreign land, and he's still dependent on God for everything. And his source of authority, his source of opinion is not Nebuchadnezzar, it's God himself. They were non-negotiable. Daniel's been sent to foreign lands. His bosses were some of the most egotistical, ruthless, cruel kings of all time. Disagreeing with the king could mean instant death. They were not only hostile to the Jewish people, but also to their God. Jews refused to acknowledge that the king of Babylon was God. It took enormous faith for Daniel to challenge the authority, and we can learn a great deal from his example. Daniel's faith, his convictions, would take him to some inconvenient and uncomfortable circumstances. It's clear his faith would put him in front of a king to interpret a dream without being told what the dream was, and if it was wrong, the king would kill him. His life literally depended on God revealing to him the source of a dream. His faith would put him with a sleepover with a lion. His faith would put him at a party to interpret God's judgment against a king by reading the writing on a wall. Faith would put his three friends in the midst of a furnace where they would encounter the Son of God. It's clear that Daniel had non-negotiable faith. And non-negotiable faith is often seen in the small details, not the big ones. No one would have blamed him for eating the king's food. No one would have blamed him for putting his prayer life on hold. No one would have blamed his three friends for bowing just this one time. After all, these were extreme circumstances, never been seen before. People can do things in extreme circumstances that they don't do otherwise. No, not if you have convictions. Convictions never change based on circumstances. I mean, no one would blame a church for shutting down during a pandemic, would they? What many believers see as an exception to the rules faithful men see as non-negotiable. It's not the big decisions that determine the quality of your faith, it's the little ones. So what is non-negotiable faith? How do we manifest it in our lives? How can we be more like Daniel in this foreign land where we find ourselves? Non-negotiable faith requires that we have established non-negotiables in our lives. What aspect of your life your faith is non-negotiable. It's more than just a set of religious beliefs. It's a commitment to risk everything you have, including your life, for those beliefs. What are your non-negotiables? Non-negotiable faith means that we refuse to submit to the lie of situational ethics. That God's word never changes just because we're in a new circumstance. Non-negotiable are true, absolute, and practical in every situation. Your convictions never change. We as a church decided long before the pandemic that the government and our society would never silence or shut down our church or God's word. So we didn't. It wasn't even really a decision at the time. We're just living in a decision that had long since been made, a conviction of the elders of our church. What was non-negotiable for Daniel? He'd surrendered to a non-negotiable Lord. For Daniel, divine law always superseded man's law, no matter what the cost. The three friends refused to bow to anyone but the God of Israel, even though the cost was a very hot night in a furnace. Daniel refused to stop bowing to the God uh, of Babylon or Babylon, even though, okay, Daniel refused to stop bowing to the God of Israel. They told him to stop, he refused to do it, even though it would cost him a visit with the lions. 
Daniel knew his home, who he represented, and whose authority he had surrendered was non-negotiable. You can't change him into a Babylonian. He's Jewish and he knows it. You see, we need to set in our hearts right now that no one will ever hold the power to overturn God's authority in our lives. It's non-negotiable. We started Remnant Church on October 12th, 2015. I'd just come off an experience where God's truth had been silenced. I remember sitting around a table at Gary Gassel's home and we declared that Remnant would never let a human, a human agency, a government, or anybody else shut down the Word of God. It would never happen on our watch. We had no idea that COVID was coming. Just a few short years, our government would try to do exactly that. Our conviction made long ago guided us to stay open, and we weren't going to compromise on it. Daniel also had a non-negotiable truth. They tried to brainwash Daniel and teach him the way of the Babylonians. The king tried to seduce him with all the king's food, the king's name for him, and the comfort of living in the king's palace. Yet Daniel had already decided where his truth comes from. He knew that the truth you believe is the truth you practice. He knew that our world will change, but our God never will. Like Daniel, we have to make God's truth in our life absolutely non-negotiable. Prophets came to warn the people. The, over time, they all drifted away. The prophet kept preaching. One day they asked him, why? Why are you still preaching when everybody's walked away? In the beginning, he said, I hope to change the people. Now I preach only to keep them from changing me. Daniel had non-negotiable service. He knew that his service to God was not for sale. His priorities were clear. God came first. Nebuchadnezzar came way after that. He was sold out for God. It was one of his non-negotiables. So Daniel had a non-negotiable Lord, a non-negotiable faith, and now a non-negotiable service. But there are other lessons we can learn from Daniel as well. This is one of the most important, I believe, for our time, particularly now. Here it is. Non-negotiable faith need not be confrontational. Talked about this at length last week. We are to share truth in love and grace and compassion and understanding and patience. During this re-election year, Christians need to share love or shut up. As I said last week, you can be completely right in what you're saying and totally wrong in how you're saying it. Learn from Daniel. Daniel knew that the spirit of what we do is as important as what we do. Notice that Daniel disagreed with everything about Babylonian life. He disagreed with what they were trying to do to his mind, what they were trying to do to his body, what they were trying to do to his God, but he didn't confront them. He didn't criticize the culture. He chose instead to lead the culture. Did you notice that while we're reading Daniel, his friends never said anything negative about the Babylonian culture. Not one word in Scripture is negative about the Babylonian culture. They didn't agree with it. Most of it, all of it, was against their morals or their religions. But instead of seeing the culture as their enemy, they saw it as their ally. Because God's ways are always better. They simply just followed God's ways. We've seen this over and over in each of these men. They just did what God said to do, and God changed the culture around them. Instead of competing with other young men of their culture, they wound up leading them. They wound up with the best jobs and the respect of the king. We saw this with Joseph. We saw it with Daniel. We'll see it with David. When they honored God, God took care of everything else. Daniel had, and this is something that's so missing in our culture, Daniel had tact. So many people lack tact. 
Last week I said I don't do social media because I can't stand to see Christians wagging their heads, spewing their self-righteous venom and not sharing the gospel in love. It drives me nuts. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, forbearance, goodness, self-control. I can't remember the last time I saw that on Fox, CNN, any newspaper, any social media exchange, or any person running for any office. What's the matter with us? Daniel led with quiet strength from deeply held, unwavering convictions based on God's truth. Daniel had tact. Tact is the art of making a point without making an enemy. Tact is the art of making a point without making an enemy. Our first option must always to be offer a peaceful solution and find common ground. We are never, never to use our faith as a weapon of righteousness. Jesus never took a non-believer and blistered them. He saved his harsh words for believers, for those who said they represented God, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He saved his harshest word for those who said they were following God and blasting out at everybody else. Daniel lived peaceably in a world that was hostile to what he believed in. He didn't let his own ego motivate him to prove other people wrong. Daniel didn't have to defend God. He knew that. He just had to represent him. God will speak for himself. Daniel's only motivation is to follow God and give him all the glory. We have to understand that when our motives are pure, when we're living by our convictions, we can live peaceably with other people who disagree with us. We have to check our motives before responding to confrontational situations. God does not need you to lash out at people who don't yet know him. He needs you to cover them in love. Non-negotiable faith means embracing the consequences of our convictions. Look at the response of Shadrach and his friends. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. They just told the king, we don't have to talk to you. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of your hand. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image, by the way, which is you, that you set up. They're telling the king Send us to the fire. We don't care. We have a different king. No matter the consequences, their faith is non-negotiable. He knew that his faith put him all in. He valued God more than he valued his own life. He trusted God even when it meant putting everything in his hands, even his life. Daniel teaches us how to live non-negotiable faith. Back in the day, I had a lot of opinions. My arrogance fueled what I should believe which should be a rewrite of the Bible. There were things in here that I just wanted to change. I didn't like it. It made me uncomfortable. It made me have to face things I didn't want to face. I, I just wanted to change a few things. Things I didn't agree with. Things that seemed ridiculous. Those Old Testament stories of people and fish and all the animals on that ark. And all. I just need to change a few things. Some of this seems ridiculous. I felt like God needed me to help him be the editor of his book. Even I know it's 2,000 years old and people have looked at it and talked about it, but he was waiting for Frank to show up and give a real opinion. I felt like he needed to modernize it and make it a book of my truth. But then I looked at the cover and it said, Holy Bible. holy. It means it's written by God. It means it's his, not mine. It means every word in this book is literally breathed by God onto the pages. 
This book self-proclaims to be God's truth and to be holy. It came with a warning not to change a single dot or a word. And it got to me unchanged after 2,000 years. I was arrogant, but at least I knew what holy meant. There was a moment in my life when my obnoxious arrogance collided with the Holy Spirit. It was an intense but very short battle that I quickly lost. I'd been wrestling with the truths of this book. I had opinions about what God should have done and how he should do things going forward. I, I was standing over this book trying to make it say what I wanted it to say. Truthfully, I'd never actually read the whole thing. I certainly hadn't studied it. And by no means did I want the Holy Spirit to teach me all things related to it. So I never rejected a book in my life that I hadn't read before. And I started asking myself, what kind of scientist are you? You're a doctor. You haven't even read this book and you've rejected it. Kind of violated my scientific integrity. How could I reject what I haven't actually read? How do I know it says what they say it says? All the time I was doing some consulting work in Sarasota and I was staying out at the colony. I know, tough life, right? Consultant at the colony on Longboat. I was studying Daniel. I still remember where I was. It's not there anymore, but I remember where I was. The prophetic claim of their captivity for 70 years. God said, I'm going to keep you in captivity for 70 years. And he said it long before they went. And guess how long they were there? 70 years. How did God know that? I was studying how God said the great world empires would come and go. The Romans, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greek. And it hit me. How does he know that? No one could have written this book but God himself. God had proved to me that this book was indeed holy. It revealed things I would never know before they happened over and over and over without one error. From that moment forward, I stopped trying to stand over this book and instead I just surrendered to it. God, this is your truth whether I understand it or not. If I don't understand it, the problem's not with you, it's with me. This has been your truth before I ever showed up. I decided on that beach on a longboat that for the rest of my life, I would never disagree with the truths of this book. I would study as deeply as possible to try to understand everything. And if I didn't, the problem wasn't with God and his truth. The problem was with my ability to understand something as overwhelming as God. God had a desire to reveal things to me that he put in this book, and I decided to get comfortable being uncomfortable with part of God's truth. This book is true even if I don't understand it. It's true even if I don't like it. This book is true no matter how I feel about it. This book contains all the answers I need, and the Holy Spirit will teach me all things once I stop fighting him. I realized when it came to the spiritual issues of my life, if God has spoken his truth, I don't have an opinion. I've already surrendered. Conviction comes from the realization that there is an absolute truth, an absolute truth that's worth dying for. Conviction is unwavering, non-negotiable, unchanged by circumstances. Opinions are held in the mind. Convictions hold your heart. Convictions are decided long before they need to be expressed. I gave the example earlier of remnants staying open every week during COVID and not closing our homeless ministries. That decision was made way back in 1997, before remnant was ever a church. It was made the day on the beach that I decided to obey God's truth no matter what, no matter what circumstances, no matter what the cost, no matter what people said. Hebrews 10, 24. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together. Is the habit of some. 
but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. God's word told us we weren't going to close. We lost half our church over that conviction. I received a lot of emails about putting lives at risk and disobeying government authorities. That as a doctor, I was being reckless. Every conviction that you have regarding God's word will cost you something. We are not sent here as ambassadors to blend in, to compromise. We are here to represent the king of our home. To speak truths of our king and declare them as our sovereign nation on foreign soil. We're here to establish God's soil on this earth. In areas where my king has spoken, I have no opinion worthy of being expressed. I'm his ambassador. I will speak his truth no matter what the circumstances. Daniel's my favorite because he had conviction. And he never, ever wavered from them. If only I could come close to doing the same. Let's pray. God, I thank you for the examples of the men and women in the scriptures. Ordinary people who were empowered by the Spirit to live out their convictions in a hostile world. And your word tells us that you showed them to us so that we could learn from them. God, help us to learn how to embrace this world that disagrees with us and at the same time honor you with all of our convictions. Help us to never waver what we believe no matter what the cost. If your word says to do it, we do it. Truth spoken, we obey. Help us, God, to stand under your word and not over it. Help us to surrender every aspect of our lives to your truth. God, may we never, ever be a people who fail to hold on to your truth as our conviction, even if it costs us our lives. We are your ambassadors on earth, sent here on a holy mission to set up sovereign rule in a foreign land and to share with people the greatness of our home. May we not fail.